This is Ada Ojai from MPPA Learning TV. Today we're going to be talking about 10 easy steps to differential diagnosis. This video is going to be particularly helpful for MP students, uh, new MPs, and also PAs. Differential diagnosis requires complex thinking method, critical thinking, and the use of scientific method. But it is very doable. This is just to give you a basic overview of how you can properly uh, differentiate uh, diagnosis in the clinical environment. Okay, so you're in a clinical environment and your patient comes in with complaints of shortness of breath. As you can see from this beautiful lady here, she is having a hard time breathing. So my question to you is, when you see this, do you understand the clinical picture? That is the first step. What is your understanding of the clinical picture or the clinical presentation? So here we have a problem. So let's call our beautiful lady patient, Jessica. So Jessica is having shortness of breath and has gotten to the point where she cannot handle it and she comes into the clinic. So at this step, for you to be able to move forward, for you to be able to understand the clinical picture, it's important that you engage in active recall. So what is active recall? Active recall is kind of combining everything that you, it's a combination of everything that you've learned in school or in experience or practice. And um, you kind of think through it and pose questions to yourself. So basically, active recall is critical thinking, basically. So active recall of likely etiology is necessary to proceed to the next step. This is primarily based on a good background in pathophysiology and physical diagnosis. For instance, this dyspnea is caused by poor oxygenation. So then you ask yourself, what disorders cause poor oxygenation? And how do I round it down to the most likely culprit? So next steps in Differential diagnosis include noting the duration and time of symptoms. Do you have a firm understanding of the etiology? Have you determined the likely etiology? Three, identify probable causes or etiology of clinical presentation. We're gonna use uh, the clinical presentation of dyspnea as an example. The differential diagnosis of dyspnea. So when your patient presents with dyspnea in a clinical setting, the first thing you should think about is whether it's acute, progressive, or chronic. So under acute, etiology include pulmonary embolism, myocardial inf infection, acute asthma exacerbation, and pneumothorax. On the progressive symptoms, um, etiology includes COPD, CHF, pulmonary hypertension, and GERD. On the chronic symptom, etiology include COPD, CHF, interstitial lung disease, bronchiectasis, cardiomyopathy, and pulmonary neoplasms. So another important step in differential diagnosis is to exclude red flags and pseudomechanism. So a pseudomechanism could be like a false hyponatremia level caused by um, hypoglycemia. It could be a drug-induced electrolyte imbalance. So these are things that you need to have in mind. Are these symptoms emblems of a red flag or pseudo mechanism. Second step, you got to check for systemic disease, anti-inflammatory processes, or neoplasms. 
you also need to figure out if these symptoms are just benign, uh, maybe it's just like uh, seasonal allerg allergies, or uh, intermittent disease variant. So we have arrived at the solution. Yay! You made it. <laughs> so here you're going to rank your probable diagnosis by anatomical disposition, physiological disposition, and pathological tenets or disposition. So you still have to make sure you identify and assess for red flags or alarming symptoms if no red flags proceed. So a red flag would be like lower extremity um, swelling, chest pain, um, those are kind of the red flags. So one thing I want to point out is that it's really important when you're differentiating diagnosis that you do rule out the red flags or the atypical uh, symptoms. You make sure that you've covered that area and that you you're ascertain that the patient just has a normal, maybe a hallmark symptomatology versus just in a typical presentation. So now you have arrived at the primary diagnosis. So you identify the primary diagnosis by clinical picture, clinical picture of features if symptoms correlate with evidence. So for the sake of demonstration and um, example, I'm going to go ahead and diagnose her with um, asthma. So I'm just using that as a generic, as, as an example. So she's having this really, really bad symptom. So I'm diagnosing her with asthma because she complains of uh, exertional dyspnea. So she has dyspnea for an exertion. She did divulge that she has uh, seasonal allergies. And um, also, she also stated that um, she gets occasional chest tightness uh, during activities. So I'm going to give her asthma as her primary diagnosis. So the, what I mean by identify your primary diagnosis by a clinical feature if symptoms correlate with evidence is as a, practi as a practitioner or an MP, a new MP or a P or new PA, you have to make sure that you have a working knowledge of common disorders in whatever setting you work, like in primary care setting, in inpatient setting, you need to know that asthma is a very common uh, presentation. Um, it's a common disorder. So you are correlating your primary diagnosis by evidence-based symptoms. So symptoms that you know that can be measured against available evidence. So another important thing is to rank your probable diagnosis by prevalence, incidence, and risk factors. So she has a risk factor of uh, seasonal rhinitis, so allergies. So that's a risk factor. And prevalence could be, you can go by your geographic uh, disposition, like being that she's young, like what kind of prevalence is going on in the community. So those are the things that you need to consider for you to be able to arrive at the, I wouldn't say perfect, but at least a working primary diagnosis. Yay, you made it. You got to the finish line. So there's still some more important steps. We're almost done. So the first thing you need to do, we have a primary diagnosis of possibly mild intermittent asthma. So for generic demonstration, you would test your hypothesized diagnosis against evidence for sensitivity. A little bit of disclaimer, you might not have time to do this in the clinical setting, but this is the real process of coming up with a differential diagnosis. It must be tested against evidence. So that's one important thing that you have to do. Two, you have to test your hypothesized diagnosis against your accumulated experience. So, you know, when you're in a clinical setting, you map out patient pattern, like what kind of patient comes in with asthma? What is the demographic? What 
is prevalent in your community, in your clinical setting. So you test your primary diagnosis against your experience. So you would be utilizing what is called hermeneutics in nursing <laughs> or philosophy or experiential knowledge. Next, you will test your hypothesized primary diagnosis against your clinical setting incidents or prevalence. So I'm kind of repeating myself here, but you test your primary diagnosis against what you know, like what you've seen in your clinical practice, what you normally diagnose people with. Thank you for watching our video. Really appreciate your time. Please subscribe to our channel. Bye.